Greetings, ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza, commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from Space. Out, from out, from out, from out, from out. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And, as always, I hope that you enjoy. And if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one. Allies Beyond. Written by 33 underscore 4P3. I am afraid that this might be the last time we'll meet, Councilman. Despite the grim mood, Ambassador Rock exuded as much grace as always. No, not Councilman. It's Connor. I'm Connor today, old friend. A human returned, trying to match the Ambassador's composure. Slowly, Ambassador Rock nodded, his facial tentacles swaying back and forth with motion. It was a habit not natural to the Sauri. Considering the sensibility of tentacles, it was quite uncomfortable. Nonetheless, he made him sure to make it a habit during his time on Earth. I see. He turned his gaze to the open window. Birds chirping, the sun shining, the wind was gentle. Would you mind going on a walk with me, my friend? Lead the way. With swift tap of his coat, Connor unlocked the door with his room, his personal guard standing at attention as it slid open. Thank you for indulging me. It's my pleasure. It's quite mind-boggling how evangelizing Zediots manage to take the stars, don't you agree? Connor's eyes raised at the ambassador's unusual straightforwardness. Though, considering the circumstances, little else was to be expected. There was little political posturing left to do. Nonetheless, the elder Sauri kept composed, like an old captain, keeping to his post as long as the ship keeps sinking. It's quite unfortunate. He leaned into the railing next to him as Rauk kept the to and fro of human society beneath him. It's even more unfortunate that not just one, but several managed to. Indeed, the word seemed to hang in the air indefinitely. Indeed, it is. The alien looked down upon his limp hand. It jerked slightly as he tried to move it, but nothing more. He could feel the tingling in the back of his spine already. There was little time left. Even more so that they decided not to tear each other's throats out until the lesser spirituality-inclined races were dealt with, wouldn't you say? How such could ever happen shall preoccupy Sauri historians for many years to come. The amphibian alien laughed heartily. It brought with it a deep rumbling. Hopefully, it will. It is of little concern to me anymore, though. Another short silence hung between them. The ships are leaving. The human councilman turned just as their engine's dull thunder reached them. As you might be aware, revenge has always been quite a motivator in human conflict. Indeed, in terms of loyalty, one could not hope for a better ally than humanity. The burgundy alien chuckled. He's quieted down softly. Half of my staff started exhibiting symptoms yesterday. 70% died overnight. I've heard. The pathogens are airborne. They are capable of surviving in water and soil for ten years, possibly more. We estimate no survivors. No survivors. Not a single Sauri. Not on land, not in water, not in the orbital stations. Connor felt a revelation hit him like a brick. An entire species wiped out. Haven't heard of that one yet, have we? The tall Sauri laughed heartily again. Not a hint of cynicism in his voice. Connor felt sick to his stomach. His laughter seemed to echo well beyond where he had stopped. The genetic databanks are on Toriel, so there are scientific and cultural ones. Fighting against the urge to vomit, Connor forced himself to remain jocular. That I have heard of. Ambassador Rourke turned to him. It had had any eyebrows, they surely would have been raised. It's been an open secret in the higher echelons for decades, Connor smirked. Even before I had my turn with the big sticks, an alliance doesn't mean stop spying. No? Somewhere in the Sauri's deep black orbs, Connor could see a hint of mischievousness glinting. And the mankind's on Europa. Additionally, let it be known that I agree with your assessment. Now, it was Connor's turn to laugh. It felt somewhat liberating to be able to freely talk about a collection of skeletons one's nation had in its closets. 
I left data stick with access codes and strategic data in your office. I appreciate the thought nonetheless, as I might remind you, my turn at the big stick is over. Why not leave it with the president? Well, I assumed he must be quite busy at the moment. The alien mouth contorted into a lipless smirk, another habit that he had formed. Or at least that is what I would say. I left a copy with him before I came to you. You didn't really need an excuse to visit, you know. Connor leaned onto the railing. Now he's turned to look into the distance. Indulge, this old fool, please. The entire situation has regrettably caused me quite a bit of mental strain. See it as a sign of my trust. Connor shook his head, apologizing. Truly, he was an old fool. If it wasn't for your discovery, they might have gotten us as well. Who knows how long they've been planning this. My species will never forget this debt. First things first, the alien waved as if to dispel the thought. Connor couldn't help but not know how his hands were flopping around limply. Considering your experience, I'd expect you to be the contender for the High Ministry of War. So, I should tell you... Our core world factories have been configured to churn out as many warships as they can. They should still have enough resources for two weeks of operations. If you manage to re-establish the supply lines, our depots have even enough raw materials for several months. Another pair of ships took off in the distance. We've modified the designs to be more human-friendly. Frankly, we thought your troops might not enjoy constant moisturization. We'll make sure to put them to good use. On the outer rims, we've made sure there's nothing left for them to take. That's the most I can promise. That's more than any of us can ask for. Silence reclaimed the emptiness between them. Thank you. There is another favor I would ask from you. The salary turned to Connor once again. You always seemed quite insistent that we salary lacked naming sense, so I would like you to come up with one. Why pass up the chance to name your own future? It is not in our hands anymore, is it? Connor gathered his thoughts for a second before narrowing it down to one name. Phoenix. Phoenix, it will be called Phoenix. A mystical beast with cultural significance. The ambassador seemed to mutter it over. I do like the name, though. It is quite obvious now that I think about it. He nodded to himself. Yes, I like it. Silence took its natural place again until Connor spoke up. Is it just me, or is the weather soured? Yes, so it would seem. Would you mind joining me for some coffee? I would, but no coffee. Now that I'm not bound by my ambassadorial duties, I can feel free to say that beverage is quite dreadful in taste, smell, and my digestive system. Perhaps I will buy you a cola. End of story. Story number two, The Bottleneck, written by 33 underscore 4P3. War in space is unfeasible. A continuous steep rumble shook the walls of the Ari station and as it slowly drifted over the barren wasteland of Mercury. It was a rumble every single one of the inhabitants had become accustomed to since it had started operations a few weeks ago. Almost exactly three years after the war had begun, the rumble that meant that it was soon. Behind the station, humanity's partial Dyson swarm clouded the sun like a thin veil. It was horribly inefficient by theoretical standards, but it was sufficed. We're at full capacity, sir, the specialist said, looking up from the display towards him. He could see in the middle of the room, surrounded by his own array of consoles. The smell of rot, the wind carrying it from the building, every tunnel, every window, bloated corpses lining the streets, faces half eaten by strays, their skin dry and cracked. He let out a breath as he shook the images from his head. He was as tense as a bowstring. Hyrex is next on our list. We're to fire as long as we can. He tried to relax his shoulders to no avail. Can you make a lad in the capital? Try as he might, his voice sounded coarse and strained. I am afraid that I do not know enough about the theocracy, geography, to pull that off, Admiral. They were joking, but the mood was grim. Shame. A mother sitting on a bench with a child, the birds fighting as they pluck at an eyeball. I want to make them burn. If they won't burn, they'll starve. Perhaps eat each other first would make our job easier. 
Behind the station sat ten fleets, all the four humanity could muster for this mission. Twenty titans, forty battleships, eight destroyers, and thousands of automated defense drones, courtesy of three different orbital defense stations, ready to spit bullets at a moment's notice. All except the sorry worlds on the fringes of human space had fallen. The last ships of their make had been destroyed during the offense run a year ago. They had lacked the offensive capabilities of the newer designs. They had become expendable. With them, the shadow of the Sari had left them. Humanity stood alone to brave their foes. The computer's gonna root. Get the go-ahead from the ships. Within a minute, the formation began shifting. The battleship built a wall, their two stage missiles locked and loaded. The defensive platforms formed in a thick coat behind them, their muzzles set in unison only leaving gaps from where the missiles would be shot. War in space is unfeasible. He did not know who had first said it, but amongst the Navy it had almost been a truism. It was an astronomical unit from the Sun to the Earth, roughly 36 to Pluto and nigh 2,000 to Proxima Centauri. It would take years for images of fleet movements to reach any systems. Nobody could spread civilization over such a vast nothingness. Humanity had tried to cast a net of sensors into the void, but there was only so much matter in the universe one could mold into the form of a buoy, and so much nothingness to cover. Once again, a jump would trigger the sensors, but most often than not, enemy fleets could penetrate deep into the home territory without humanity being none the wiser. War in space was chaos. In space, there were no bottlenecks, no fortresses to hold the enemy from civilization, only strategic resources to defend. Planets, orbital stations armed with metaphorical teeth swirling around high orbits, laying in wait for the moment an enemy fleet popped out before it started to rain down howl. Either the stations managed to pluck all the MPs out of the sky, or the planet was lost to the thermonuclear. If the defenses held, they would shred one or two ships apart, but then the fleet would disappear deep into the unknown of the void again, taking course to its next target. When the news of the raid was transmitted to the front lines, they would mount a counter-raid, as hopefully the defenders tied up some of their defenses, leaving their planets vulnerable. Rarely did any raid succeed. But if they did, it meant the loss of vital source of steel, uranium, and infrastructure to keep the gears of war machines spinning. It meant less drones for the defense and less ships for the offense. The last three years, humanity had slowly been sliding towards certain defeat. There are in position, a female voice called out from somewhere to his left. He didn't look up, and although he heard, the images were haunting him again. We are ready to initiate launching procedure, Admiral, another voice added. Start the countdown. His words came out as a low growl. In the back of his mind, he knew that this older wood billions would die. He didn't care. That was why he had been chosen for the position. A darkened room, holding his wife's hand as the life left her eyes, holding it as she turned cold, holding it as her skin started shriveling up. Tears. Many tears. Three, two, one. He had spaced out again. With a giant plume of flame, the missiles shot out of the battleships. One volley, two volleys, three volleys. They raced tightly next to each other, draining after the bullets from before. Almost instantaneously, the rumbling stop and the deafening crack of the shook the walls of the entire station. The compression had worked. The accumulated energy of several tons of energized antimatter was focused into a point of 50 by 50 meters. One giant warp right through the theocracy's doorstep, compressing lengths of space never seen before by power of unbridled energy for a fraction of a second. A fraction was enough. The missiles had passed the defensive platform whose recoil had made them bounce from the hulls of the battleships behind them, reorienting themselves. The battleships reloaded and resumed defensive positions with the rest of the fleets. Over the theocracy space, the projectiles would tear a hole in the defensive systems. The dummy missiles and EMPs would accelerate and draw fire. 
detonating when in range of orbital drones. Then pure thermonuclear death would rain down upon the planet, disintegrating every last living thing. A sly grin etched itself onto his face as he imagined how they would be torn apart, limb from limb, cell from cell, molecule by molecule, atom by atom. They filled him with such maniacal glee, it was wonderful. He remembered the disappointing eyes of the Minister of War as the War Council had chosen him, but even he had known that he was a man for the job. War demanded deaths, and he didn't care how many he killed, as they all should. Sir, the specialist called out as the radar on his displays lit up. We have multiple hostile fleets approaching. In a split second, reality seemed to slow down to a crawl. This was it. He could feel every muscle in his body tense, adrenaline clearing the now razor-sharp mind. He let out a breath as he watched them on the sensors. They were closing the distance rapidly. The darkness of space still obscured them from his eyes, but the radar painted a clear picture. Eighteen fleets, eighteen fleets against five and three orbital stations. This was it. This would be where the war was decided. High over the barren wasteland of Mercury, the fire of the sun raging like humanity's combined wrath as a backdrop. Today, there would be no running, no disappearing into the in-between. The theocracy had to destroy their position, lest they face total annihilation. Today, the first fortress battle in space had begun. The five fleets settled into their attack formation, spaced out all around them. They were the bottleneck. Men, he felt oddly calm as the first ships crossed the firing range. Let's show them hell. Then, of story. Story number three. The warning, written by 33 underscore 4P3. First, they had found the debris. A gigantic vessel brutally cut it. Their skeletons forever sent adrift in the void forever. Orbiting on the outer stretches of the inner solar system, evenly spaced. They sent men into them, searching for any records, any clue of the battle that might have taken place here. What they found was that each vessel had been stripped bare of any weapon system or data storage. Nothing but husks. That the scorch marks and impact holes didn't lie. Security measures were raised. They was a warning as clear as any. They continued on. Then they found the planets. Gigantic craters marred their surface from hundreds of bombs, many bigger than any that they had ever detonated. Though vegetation had already reclaimed the planets, the background radiation was still elevated. The weapons hadn't been dropped to kill, they had been dropped to utterly annihilate. They took probes, taking note of the highly radioactive layer of soil, placing the extinction events somewhere around the middle of the Neolithic era. Security measures were further raised. They placed them in the lower ranks of possible colonization candidates and continued on. System for system, they continued on. They found the crashed remains of a gigantic space station, apparently once tethered to the ground by an enormous cable, tripped to the core. They found the remains of small mining stations, likely defenseless, shot down without remorse. Their systems picked up a faint distress call from one of the orbiting husks. Following it, they arrived at a small room filled with corpses, their bones splintered, pulverized beyond recognition. Military escorts were ordered to every exploration ship. After a hundred systems, more ships joined the orbiting ones, ships of different makes, definitely embroidered, shot down and stripped bare all the same. After another hundred, what they could only assume had to be escape pods joined. After another hundred, civilian vessels. Then the celestial bodies vanished. No planets, no moons, only the occasional asteroid here and there. And, of course, the ring of ships orbiting the star. Meetings were called, heated arguments were had. Half the brass wanted to abort the exploration mission and establish a no man's land, arguing that whatever was out there definitely wanted them to stay away. The other half argued that they had to know the enemy, or they would be caught by surprise when they were attacked. One thing they agreed on, whatever was out there was old, powerful, merciless, and, in all likelihood, hostile. Me, 
At that time, I wasn't sure what, who was right, only that whatever was out there scared me crapless. The brass agreed on pushing the limits a little more. After another hundred systems, they found maps burned into the hull of every vessel. It showed two nations surrounded by three others, and borders of the two nations were burned thickly. The outer nations scorched over. There was only one gap in the border, the system beyond it marked with a circle. The message was clear. The brass debated sending a small cloaked scouting vessel beyond the border, tasked only to take a quick look before dropping out again. The proposal was rejected, and the Admiral of the Fourth Fleet ignored the decision. This last transmission was a panic distress call. When the Sixth Fleet reached his location, they discovered that his ship had joined every present ring of vessels. They had been ripped apart by rounds massive enough to effortlessly pierce even the armored hull of the strongest dreadnoughts. The distress beacon had relocated to another ship. Next to it, in an adjacent room, the bodies of the crew that hadn't been blown into space, ripped apart by the kinetic rounds at short range, conserved in sealed boxes. There were limbs were placed, made to seem like they were peacefully asleep. A small symbol of goodwill, perhaps. The brass made a decision. The leviathans, as they had taken to be calling them, now knew that they were there. Though the speed and accuracy with which they had jumped and dispatched the fourth fleet made them question whether they'd been monitoring their approach all along. In all likelihood, they had taken prisoners and would soon know all about them and their military structure, perhaps deciding whether to exterminate them or not. They had nothing to lose. Thus, a small vessel dispatched into the mocked system, carrying diplomats and envoys, their escorts outside, weapons locked and loaded, waiting, though definitely not too eager, on the signal for them to jump into system. That is where I come in. They said that my crew was chosen due to my record of disescalating conflicts. At least, that is what they told me. In truth, they believed us to be dead in the water already. Nobody expected anything to come of this negotiation. I've been told the brass didn't expect there to be a negotiation in the first place. They expected everyone from the thousand fleets pouring out of the systems the moment we jumped in, to the leviathan sending us back in quarters. Their best case scenario was a hostage situation. It was the only thing that they could do at least somewhat expect to do something about. I can tell you, as the pilot counted our jump down, I thought back of my life. On the pirates, in the mining stations, and the revolt in the penal colony. In that moment, all I could think about was that I should have just ordered each of these prickers shot without remorse. My heart was thumping right in my head, I tell you, though I thought I was about to have an aneurysm. Then we jumped. I didn't want to open my eyes. I didn't expect I'd ever get to open my eyes again. I thought that we would get shredded like those poor bastards of the fourth. I thought that this would just be a sick joke, that Leviathans mocking our foolishness as they shot us from the sky. Unexpectedly, I opened my eyes again. We thought that they had some technology to mask prevent us from peering into their system. All we ever got when looking into the territory were a few stray photons, distant heat signatures of something working. Nothing could have prepared us. A citadel, a true citadel. You think the one above Petunia is big? That citadel dwarfed by a thousand times easily. Some poor engineer that looked close to the falling unconscious mouth as it was bigger than our home world. He was probably right. And all the way to it were these floating cubes, just floating in space. We didn't know what they were until we decided to get closer and our targeting system went off the rockers. So we just continued on, towards the behemoth. Then it dawned on me. I had been so shocked already that I hadn't even noticed the most obvious thing. There was no star. I think I actually started to laugh. It was so obvious that it was no technology to mask our senses. There were no stars. Artificial gravity of the scale of a solar system. It was like the universe itself looked down and mocked us. We were nothing. All of our fleets, pea shooters, we were in the realm of the gods, no doubt about it. So we continued onwards. 
Some of us paced around endlessly. The envoys were scribbling around in their speeches, sweat dripping from every pore. Others sat in the corner and cowered. I couldn't blame them. I just froze in fear as I saw the hangar on that monster open up, like a giant maw beckoning us in. We landed somewhere. We had enough space anyways. To their hangars, we were like flies to his owls. Small, puny, pitiful. Just the thought of the ships this hangar could hold, the hangar could construct, made me scream internally. When we opened our hatch, they were already there. Giants, giants in black and grey armor as thick as a bimoth's thigh, carrying rifles that looked like they could give our ship's main cannon a run for its money. I could see few of my men's hands shoot to their holsters. Nothing our guns could spit out could ever hope to penetrate what armor these monsters wore. So I wasn't so sure whether they were actually considering opening fire or shooting themselves. Honestly, the former seemed like a quick way to die. They formed a line, standing at attention as a creature appeared. Beneath its helmet, I could see its faces. The leviathan was pale and fleshy, the hair growing above its eyes on the top of its head. It didn't look very pleased. I wanted nothing more than to run. It was small, smaller than we were, but thinking about its size would only lead you astray. These were the leviathans. The one that stood before me looked unassuming, yet even then I could see no firearm on him. I wouldn't put it past him to be able to scatter our items with the winds with a flick of his wrists. The head and boy presented them a drive with shaking hands. It contained all they had to know and comprehend our language, in every accent and every alphabet. It was something frantically scrambled together as a gesture of goodwill, to perhaps avoid the inevitability. The creature looked at it and gave it back and spoke. That won't be necessary. I could feel the dread in the air. They knew our language. They had been watching. They had been in our system. I greet you on behalf of humanity, he continued, contorting his limbs in a crude imitation of a gesture of greeting, made impossible by the placement of his joints. His voice carried an edge. One of the braver young consuls stepped forward, his eyes warily flicking to the giants next to us. We desire nothing but peaceful coexistence. If the giants understood us, they didn't respond. That was if they were human to begin with. So do we, the man spoke, and I felt the collective sigh of relief going through our ranks as the burden of our civilizations fell on our shoulders. I resume you received our message. I was confused before my mind flickered back to the images from the briefing. Fleets, civilian transports, escape pods, shattered bones, unbridled destruction. His voice was harsh and I could feel my heart racing. Any ship entering our territory will be shot down. All trade and contact will be commenced through the system. Your cargo will be scanned with utmost precision. You will not settle any systems in our borders. He narrowed his eyes and stared at the head envoy. There was something in them, something fierce yet unreadable. A long time ago, we were attacked by our neighbors. They purged our allies from the face of the galaxy, and if it weren't for their genetic data, they would remain so even now. The lands beyond our border should tell you what befell them in return. Thus, let me make it clear, should any military vessel enter our system, it will be treated as a full invasion and be returned in kind. I felt every single one of my nostrils closing, clamping down as he continued, Do not attempt to hide anything in your cargo. Do not attempt to double-cross us. We shall remain impartial in your conflicts, and any attempt to deceive us will be met with annihilation. The man smiled at us. You may leave now. The armored titans turned and left alongside the man that we had spoken to. Nobody said a word that we could have spent an eternity in silence, but somehow we all boarded our ship and left, the cubes never letting us stray too far from our path. I think nobody knew exactly what to say, what to think, so we just left, and I can swear on my grave that I plan to never return there again. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. 
But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode. And I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.